Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Atna Brunchano. I'm a master board fellow at the European University Institute. And today I have the great pleasure of interviewing Professor Henry uh, Bones from uh, Cornell University. I will be joined by Tamara Popic, uh, who is a master board fellow as well. Um, Professor Henry uh, Bones is an Aaron Minnecourt Professor Emeritus at Cornell University. Um, she has written, co written, and co edited. Uh, Five books, including a forthcoming edited volume mm -hmm. at the, uh, the Oxford University Press next year on um, citizens in the state preparing Russia and China. Her research focuses on transitions to and, to and from democracy, uh, authoritarian politics, and US and Russian uh, foreign policy. Professor Moons um, kindly agreed to give a master of lecture later today um, at the Master Program. For that, the US uh, Russian game of weaponizing elections. So, thank you for agreeing to, to um, discuss with us today about your research. Um, you have a forthcoming volume next year. Okay. Uh, could you tell us more about that? Um, yeah, I, I will. It's a, it really is it, it's a volume which, among other things, has almost entirely all females in it mm -hmm. and very few males. We have a few token males that we have included. But it, it all came about with three of us, who, uh, one of whom is Carrie Queso, who's a former student of mine who works on Russia and China, and actually does comparative work on both of them, and a colleague of mine who works only on China. Um, and the three of us were talking about, in the old days during the Cold War, question we might return to, um, there were a lot of discussions of comparing the Soviet Union then called, obviously, in China. But there was virtually nothing dealing with this issue since the collapse of the Soviet Union and since the radical change in, in both Russia's role in the international system, et cetera. We were also very interested in the question of, of um, different forms of authoritarianism um, and looking at the Russian case, which is a competitive form of authoritarianism, which say of national elections that are competitive, it's not on an even playing field, but they're competitive. Versus China, which does not. It has some competitive local elections, but you basically have Communist Party in Germany. Um, and you have a real Communist Party. United Russia is, as I like to say, a parking place for corrupt people <laughs> rather than a real political party. Um, and so we thought we'd bring together a lot of scholars who are working on relations between the state and the society in, in the two countries to see similarities and differences. And uh, what was interesting, I'll just say, I like one thing that came through that was inductive. It happened, we had two conferences, and it happened as a result of the conferences, this thing came up, that the Chinese state worries a lot more about, obviously, controlling public opinion, controlling political behavior. And they work hard to co-opt people. They work very hard to co-opt. And so in a weird kind of way, a lot of people in China have some influence because the state cares enough. The Russian state doesn't care. Um, and, and so basically, in a way, within very circumscribed parameters, publics in China have more impact on public policy than publics in Russia despite the fact that one is elected and the other. So it's a kind of a counterintuitive kind of argument. So anyway, it's coming out next year, but it was just fascinating. It was mainly young scholars. And it was just fascinating looking at the work they had done in, in Russia and China. We have some chapters that are comparing the two. Uh, and then we have a lot of chapters for these scholars to be one in the other case. So anyway, I'm excited about the project. It was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Thank you. So, uh, with the next question, uh, we wanted to go back into the past a bit. You, you mentioned already you worked on authoritarian regimes. So, the question is that um, uh, what was your main motivation to start working on issues of state socialism yeah. back uh, in the 70s and 80s? And then also, was like work on authoritarian regimes a logical or historical yeah. consequence of that? Well, I'll just answer the second part first mm -hmm. that, that when some of the regimes I worked on started returning to authoritarianism. I felt like I was coming home. <laughs> and uh, in a funny way, I, I thought, oh my god, I know about this, uh, if I could dust off my knowledge from the past. 
But I was interested in state socialism, mainly most people at that time, because I was interested in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a uh, working class leftist family in the United States, and I had a certain ideological sympathy. At the same time, of course, the Soviet experiment was tragic and awful in many ways, and so I was not naive you know, about that. Um, and so I got very interested in that, and, um, and I grew up during the Cold War, and so of course the Soviet Union was the other case. I also have a kind of a contrary streak in my work and, and the way I've lived, and um, oppositional maybe, <laughs> uh, but, but there was a contradiction that ran through the study of the Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe at the time during communism. The Soviet Union was a disaster. It was going to fall apart. It was, it was, it was, it didn't make any sense. It was counter, it, you know, it didn't fit with the way humans work and blah, 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 all this stuff. At the same time, the Soviet Union's a terrible threat because it's so strong. So there was this contradiction mm -hmm. that bothered me a lot. And, and similarly, why did it last so long if it was such a stupid system that didn't make any sense? Why did it last so long? Because it still is, the Soviet Union is still lasted beyond how long China has lasted as Congress regime. For example, three more years of be tied. But um, so so I wanted to kind of find out why it was resilient and under what conditions it would not be resilient. So I think that was always my yeah, my thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was just mentioning I worked on Eastern Europe because it was easier to do research on Eastern Europe. And I uh, and so my first country I did field work in was Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. So uh, and uh, so I gravitated. It was hard for political scientists to do anything in, the Soviet mm -hmm. Union in those days. And so I looked at the Soviet Union from Eastern Europe as well as in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. I see. So there's some practical reasons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the next question is: You're kind of traveling 30 years now from the fall of communism. Okay. okay. So it's about East European exceptionalism. So the scholars who work in Eastern Europe and post-communist countries, for example, in the field of welfare state or party politics, very often face this claim of Eastern European exceptionalism. So there's something specific about this region, either due to the legacies or because of this common uh, socialist past, that makes actually theories that are usually uh, coined in the West very difficult to, uh, to be applied in that region. And also the other way around, what we find out in Eastern Europe is kind of difficult to be applied elsewhere because it's specific. So in your work, you actually have very successfully shown how findings that you had there, that you built uh, while working on the region, uh, could travel to other regions. And uh, why do you think that this view of East European exceptionalism still persists now, even 30 years? Actually, this year we are celebrating 30 years of the yeah. fall of communism. So why is that so? Well, I, I think you know, a couple of different things go on with that. One is just having finished this project on Russia and China. Boy, talk about two groups of scholars who think they who find it very hard to listen to each other, you know, because they both do big, tough countries and they're you know, unique. Um, but they really listen to each other at this conference and I thought that was a good thing. There's a tendency to think the region that you've worked so hard to understand or a country is exceptional. You'd like to believe that. You'd like to believe that um, you have special knowledge. You know, um, it's a kind of a, 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 an ego thing in part. The other thing is that during communism, uh, because I was unusual straddling those Soviet and Eastern European studies, um, Eastern European countries were treated as an afterthought. The field was dominated by Soviet specialists. Mm -hmm. And so Eastern Europeans developed a strong sense of pushback, a strong sense of, uh, you know, we're important in our own right. And one way you make that claim is to claim that you're exceptional, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think there was that, um, and, and, uh, but I think at the same time it hit me, um, someone said, and I've never been able to trace down who this is, it was an economist who said this to me from Eastern Europe, when communism fell, and it was a he, I remember that, he said, he said, you know, what we created under communism was a museum of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and it hit me so hard because I grew up in Detroit. I knew what the Museum of the Industrial Revolution looked like. And I thought, maybe that's it. Maybe that's how I fell in love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew where I was. There was this know. connection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I see. Thank you. So, um, about the next question. So, so we want to, you have worked extensively on, on this 19 way, 89 way of transitions in, in uh, Eastern European countries from authoritarian. Uh, democracy. Uh, so 
you know, they took my flag um, 30 years later, when in 2019, so 30 years have passed. How, how do you characterize the social and political situation in no. Eastern Europe now, no. in 2019? And I would like to link this question also to two particular cases in Eastern Europe. Um, there have been recent political developments, in, uh, especially in Poland and Hungary, which have been labeled by some scholars as a backsliding of democracy. And reading some of your work, uh, I realized that these uh, this two cases, Poland and Hungary, were actually cases of uh, negotiated transition from authoritarianism towards the path toward democracy, right? With a very important role in the solidarity movement and gradual mm -hmm. liberalization in Hungary. So, how did we get here from two countries <laughs> that went to negotiate the transition where there were this sort of bottom up uh, mm -hmm. movement? To our country, to our two cases where uh, we are speaking now of backsliding of democracy. Do you see it more as a sort of citizen's disillusionment with democracy, or do you think it's more a driven process that is kind of kind of explaining this trend? Well, you know, we're all discussing this. Yeah, we've been discussing it <coughs> probably since um, 2010 when Orban came to power mm -hmm. and became obvious what was going what was starting to happen. But you know, for those of us who worked in Russia, um, we were looking at it beginning in 2000 because uh, we were beginning to get very, very worried, certainly by 2004. Um, and, and I feel that uh, the funny thing about that, of course, is that Russia would be the first to undergo a decline in democracy because it had such a shaky one to start with. Um, and there, was, there were a million reasons why it shouldn't have worked in Russia. And so the Yeltsin years were improbable, completely improbable. You know, whether you look at economic crisis or whatever, whatever explanatory model you have, um, but you know, I think I, I would highlight a couple of things, and and uh, but I think this is a very very open question. I think a lot of people are stunned. We just had the elections in Poland. Not such good news. <laughs> um, one thing I would I would say because of what we're, what's going on in the United States, where we're having a democratic breakdown as well. Um, at least a deterioration in the quality of democracy. Um, but I've been scared it might be more than that. That's too soft a terminology. One issue is that we, we who worked on transitions jump too quickly to the term consolidation. We've all written, those of us my generation worked on the issues, we've all written on consolidation. We all have our uh, hierarchy of who was more, which countries were more, which countries were less consolidated. Um, if you'd asked any of us before communism collapsed, and you were able to imagine the breakup of the states, I'll just leave that as a big assumption here, we would have been pretty accurate about where things looked 10 years after the transition. We would have been able to predict that. Say, okay, let's imagine there could be democracy. Which cases do you think would have the strongest case you know, for democracy? We would have said within the former Yugoslavia Soviet Union, said that. Um, we would have said, um, you know, if we had to choose, we would have been Poland and Hungary at the top, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and then it turns out that, that we thought that meant because they had more raw material in place at the end of communism, that that led to something called consolidation. We were dead wrong. We were dead wrong, you know, and, and, and I go back to the old titles of the old transitions literature, uh, conclusions about uncertain democracies. And it turns out, uncertain democracies. We also thought, by the way, that the EU would be, in effect, a key player in terms of a guarantor of democracy. Um, so, so we underestimated that. And yet, if we had lived in the United States, as I did, I'm an American, I don't know why I was so naive. I mean, the United States was not really a democracy until 1965 because it did not have free, open participation by all citizens. It did not until the Voting Rights Act. And now we're facing a crisis that's been going on actually for some time. It's gotten worse in terms of excluding parts of the population from full-scale participation. So an American, of all people, they say, oh, America is the oldest democracy, Sacramento. Well, America of all people, I mean, 
we should have thought, yeah, well, um, um, democracy is a moving target, democracy, you can improve it you know, up downhill, you can do all these things. It's not a linear story. So we were, uh, we had reasons not to be so naive. You know, we really did. Um, and, and yet we said, oh, well, you know, home free. They will be on a sustainable democratic course. So that's one issue is that um, we got trapped in something that's bothered the social sciences for a long time, and that is linearity. You know, oh, that, that task is done. Let's move on to the next one. And it didn't work that way. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that there is a certain it seems to me that what happened in Eastern Europe, we just focus on Poland and Hungary, that the process of integration of the European Union, the process of globalization of the economy, all these processes were fundamentally counterposed with a strong sense of national identity and traditional culture. And people did not exchange one kind cultural and economic force-fed project for another. The Soviet bloc had a vision of where you were supposed to go, um, and so did the EU. And so what you got was a loss of national spirit, and you're finding that all over the world for a reason. And given them one number two, let's also be clear, and I, I don't want to get too much into the details, there's also the Russian side and social media, which has done an extraordinarily effective job of playing into grievances already there. Um, and it's very, very hard to measure, very, very hard to nail down. What really strikes me when I look at Poland and Hungary is how much the coalitions in support of these dangerous leaders um, in both countries look like Trump's coalition in the United States anti-urban, you know, it is rural and small town, it has a whole series of characteristics, grievances against immigrants, a variety of different things, which are pretty familiar to those of us who have worked on nationalism. Looks familiar. You know, it looks like the structure that most of you just support in Serbia. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't Belgrade ever, but it was a lot of other small towns, etc. <clears throat> so, so I think a cleavage that we kind of thought, and this is a linearity problem again, a cleavage that we kind of thought, well, modernity is one. Well, you know, it didn't really win completely, or it didn't bring everyone in. Um, I think there's also, I'll just say a final thing here, because I want to talk to you. There's also a generation issue that many countries are facing. Um, so, for example, Trump's support is old white guys. You know, I'm married to an old white guy. I have nothing against old white guys. But, you know, there are a lot of male old white guys running around, apparently. Um, and so there's that. But there's, there's in, in Eastern Europe, the people who have seen the most change, you could make arguments about the contrast with communism, etc. That younger generation doesn't have that advantage. Mm -hmm. The younger generation has higher expectations. In the US, we're seeing a real slowdown in social mobility for young people. They're mad, but they're moving because it's the US context. They're moving left, not right. Um, but, but I think that there's a lot of stuff that is in the stew here, in a lot of ingredients. Um, but I think you know we were blind in the U.S. too, we were blind to a lot of developments on the ground, and we weren't unpacking, among other things, public opinion. Um, and one thing I haven't mentioned that I think everyone agrees on, at least right, is that we've had a disintegration of the political party system and the cleavages upon which they rest. And Fidesz and Hungary give me a break. That's not really a party. It's you know, United Russia, not a party. In the Polish case, law and justice has become a more of a political party. But the traditional party structure is a mess. And it's not there to organize.
party's interests, it's not their represent. And that's because the cleavages of the world in which we live are not the traditional cleavages upon which that party system is based. So we'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe too long answer. Yeah, no, okay, fine. Uh, so now we move to your Max Weber lecture, actually, you will cover it later today. So uh, in your lecture, you used the term weaponizing election to actually describe the US Russia. Uh, what you call it for that again between these two countries. So, uh, would you say that uh, this instrument instrumentalization of democratic elements such as election uh, uh, in order to interfere in the politics of another country is uh, something specific for the relationship between these two countries, or it's more uh, a sign of a new phase in the post Cold War era? And uh, also, what in your view are broader political consequences of this tit for tat game? And also, linked to that, and uh, you already did mention something about that in your earlier answers. Uh, what, in your opinion, right now are the prospects of a color revolution in Russia? Because throughout your work, you kind of did, did change your view of how likely it is to change uh, to happen in Russia. So what is your point of view right now? And how much this relationship between US and Russia can have an influence in that? Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, uh, the US and Russia, because they are in different ways, at least you know, major powers, but in different ways, they are in a situation where what happens to the other one matters, and that is reminiscent of, of, of the Cold War. Um, but I think that, you know, what I'll argue today has to do with the fact that elections are weaponized in the United States because the struggle over, over elections is really a struggle over who votes, who has the right to vote, who turns out. Who turns out is always an issue in Democratic. But in the U.S., it has really to do with it's much harder to vote in the United States than in Europe because it's much harder to register. Uh, more obstacles are put in place, and those obstacles, unfortunately, um, are largely, I will say, put in place by the Republican Party uh, because they want to demobilize certain segments of the population. Uh, so when I say weaponized, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about Putin's case. I won't be talking about the domestic side much today, but in the lecture, but. Uh, in Putin's case, you know, it's of course, in effect, um, um, using elections to create, with, with Beatrix Mantelloni argues in her work, an aura of invincibility. In other words, why bother voting? Mm -hmm. It's going to be most of it to, yeah. to Why bother voting, you know? Um, Putin doesn't usually steal elections. He doesn't have to. At some point, he will have to very soon. And that's when things are going to get ugly. Um, but there is, again, using elections to, in effect, maintain and build coalitions, that's normal. But the dirty tricks involved, the exclusion of politics involved, that's another thing. And then you have the external involvement. Um, you know, Boris Yeltsin, 1996, I'm not sure he would have won that runoff without American help. Maybe he would have, but you know, it, it, and that was the beginning of a kind of a story. Oh my God! You know, what did the communists won in 1996? You got to help Yeltsin, who was wildly unpopular, wildly unpopular. Um, and the U.S. has intervened in all kinds of elections in, in the Soviet zone of influence. And so, um, so elections it's a common denominator between competitive authoritarian regimes and countries like the United States or Poland or anything else, um, or any of the other semi or real democracies. So. What's happening is that uh, it's become fair game to involve yourself in other elections. Um, and so I think that that is, is, is a very, very, very dangerous, dangerous development because we expect elections not just to choose leaders but to transfer legitimacy. We expect elections to coordinate a relationship between public preferences in public policy. That's the point of it. Um, we expect elections to throw the rascals out should that be necessary. Uh, a variety of different reasons to have accountable government that's inclusive of the electorate. With all this manipulation at home and this manipulation abroad, that whole thing falls apart. Just disintegrates. And so elections can't play the roles that they're supposed to play in creating a vivid, useful, well-performing democracy. So, is that, I think you Yeah, I, I yeah. think so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if, if I can follow up on this, so, are, is, this, is this a danger because the informational context within which citizens make their decisions is distorted, or do you think there are elements, that there are other elements here that... that yeah, we have, a, we have a problem all over the world with how to manage information. Um, what 
watching, I don't mean to keep bringing up the U.S., but I've become incredibly interested in U.S. politics as an example, but watching some of these Republicans with their conspiracy theories, I'm sorry, but it's just too crazy to be believed. And yet they believe it. So what there is not is um, selection of information in a critical way. Look at it. And the worst people are my generation and older because they have had less experience than younger people with being able to develop that kind of uh, capacity to evaluate the quality of information they receive. Um, and so if you listen to, I'll just say one thing, if you listen to congressional hearings, which no one should listen to because it's so boring, but let's say you listen to them. Some of the things that our members of Congress say, not just how stupid the, these conspiracy theories are, the way they look at the world, they have no idea how social media works at all. They are clueless about all of these things. So how can they possibly? make good decisions. How can they possibly? So it's everybody's having a problem with this, sorting it through, etc. This is fascinating. Um, I think we're approaching the end of our interview, but I didn't want to finish uh, our uh, brief discussion without um, moving a bit the discussion towards the Middle East and North African countries that um, faced uh, the Arab Spring um, of their uprisings. And um, what I found fascinating in, in the text that uh, was circulating for tomorrow's masterclass, you identified some similarities between the conditions that led to popular uprisings in, in several former uh, communist countries like Romania and Bulgaria, mm -hmm. and the popular mobilizations uh, of the Arab Spring. So uh, I was just wondering where do you see the MENA countries, Middle East and North African countries? Yeah, yeah. How do you see, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it's a democracy. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me just say, well, I should say what they just asked about color revolution. I wrote a whole article on this in, in, in Dallas, and, and I just want to say quickly, we're getting there. And, and you know, the, some of the pieces are getting in place um, in, in the Russian case, and it will indeed be, I think that's the way it has to happen to get rid of Putin. But I want to get back to bringing that in because when I, my book came out on, on diffusion, just about the time the Arab Spring started up. And so I became a kind of a, 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 a little dog that followed around the people that worked on the Middle East and North Africa. And they were anxious to have somebody following them around talking about diffusion and popular uprisings and things. What struck me, and, and, and actually I want to just tell a little story. I was um, in uh, uh, Bibra and uh, about 19... Anyway, it was about three years before the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing some people in Bayra, and suddenly I ran into someone I knew who was just coming back from Tunisia. Mm -hmm. There was a member of Oak Port. Mm -hmm. And I said, why are you in Tunisia? He said, are you kidding? You know, that's our next place. And I remember it just stuck in my head because I wasn't interviewing about that. And lo and behold, there we have it. I mean, I'm not saying Oak Port caused the uprising, of course they are. They would like to think that. They're really full of themselves. They do, too. They're pretty funny guys. Anyway, I don't know. Guys, they're right. Um, so, so, so what hit me when I started, it was very interesting hanging out with people who work on the Middle East and North Africa who think they're exceptional. All their countries are exceptional. Mm -hmm. And most of them work on one country, and they think it's extraordinary and exceptional. And, and they were caught flat-footed. Now, I have to say, in 1989, we were not caught flat-footed if we worked on Eastern Europe. The Soviet specialists were caught flat-footed. You know, they didn't, oh my God, this is unbelievable, what are we supposed to do? But a lot of people worked on Poland and Hungary, especially if we were waiting for something, some kind of transition, not that we predicted when or exactly how, but we knew something was going to happen at some point. We were not confident and the ability of the system to survive any stressors. Um, when I started talking to people who work in the Middle East North Africa, I started reading broadly in it. It was fascinating work. Boy, they were so ill-prepared for change, the people working on it. They just 
they thought authoritarianism as profoundly resilient. So then they started going to these conferences when, when the events happened, and um, it was very interesting because I said a couple of things right away. Um, I said other things, but of course I conveniently remembered a couple of things I'm glad I said. Um, and one of them was, I said, you know, except for today's, you've got a problem with that military. We just didn't have that except for the former Yugoslavia. We didn't have that in Eastern Europe. It, it just wasn't the same structure in terms of the way the governments ruled under communism. Um, and I said, you know, until you get the military on your side, I don't know. I was pretty, I thought that was a good. The other thing is the opposition was not very developed, more so in Egypt than anywhere else, but to some degree Tunisia. But otherwise, and I looked at it and I thought, okay, this could be 1956. This could be 1968. This could be 1980. In other words, the earlier crises in Eastern Europe that did not go anywhere. Aside from invest in the long term in the development of an opposition, or the Croatian crisis in 72, or something like that. It could have, you know, so prior crises invested in a certain dynamism of the opposition. They had to learn because they lost. The regime didn't learn much, but the opposition did. You did not have that track record in the Middle East and North Africa. You did not. I mean, Tunisia was, you know, it, you just didn't have it. I mean, in Egypt, you had a fairly strong labor movement, so you had something there. But for most of those countries, no. So that's what hit me at the time. I said, you know, you've got diffusion, and you've got the spread, but the diffusion wasn't as delivered, as well thought out. They didn't have a formula quite, but the e Egypt approach. Um, you know, Friday prayers and you know, some things like that that had a sort of mobilization dynamic to them, a, a repertoire. That passed on to some degree. But you didn't have what we called in, Sharon and I called the book The Electoral Model, where you had a whole to-do list. You know, this is going to work, but these are the things you have to do if you're going to use elections to overthrow authoritarian rulers. You know, uh, they didn't have that in the Middle East ago. So it was really different. The other thing is that they didn't have a Soviet Union. Ultimately, Gorbachev was the guarantor of what happened in Eastern Europe. And uh, you can't congratulate him enough for that, in my opinion. But he was the guarantor of it. Um, not for, I mean, the Yugoslav case is different because it wasn't a plot. But anyway, he was, he was very important at critical stages. He had shepherd Nazi. Um, you had Saudi Arabia, which did not want the fusion. Um, so the largest power in the region was, to put it mildly, authoritarian, not to mention patriarchal and everything else. Kills journalists, uh, you name it. So you didn't have that regional substructure which facilitated, you know, a continuation of the process. It's very important. So I think we're uh, yeah. at the end of the interview. Thank you very much for uh, having well, you're us. You're quite welcome. <laughs> okay. Today, and we look forward to, uh, to okay. the master of lecture later.